Keon Tedder has been the state representative for House District 109 for three years. He now is running for State Senate District 42, where he wants to become the district's next senator. I talk one-on-one -on -one with Dion for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. South Carolina State Representative Dion Tanner, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you to have you. Uh, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I know you're busy, so I appreciate it greatly. Needless to say, the last time I was I interviewed you was 2020 when you ran for South Carolina uh, House District 109, and you've been in the office now for three years. And obviously, we all have seen over the past couple of weeks your signs all over <laughs> since Senate District 42, as you are one of the Democratic candidates for that seat to replace uh, the former senators, uh, Marlon Kempson. Tell me, what got you from being in the House for three years to now saying that you want to run and represent the folks of Senate District 42? Yeah, so uh, my district uh, uniquely overlaps, has a large overlap in District 42. So uh, House 109 is, is uh, a lot of my district is within Senate District 42. So I, I'd still be representing the same people, uh, majority of them, and just picking up a lot more. And the reason why I feel like I want to move to the Senate is because uh, I think I can do more um, in the Senate. I can be more effective, uh, have more of an impact on our district back home. And by that, I mean the Senate just allows, they have different rules and procedures that the House does not have. And um, as you know, we're in a super minority in the Democratic Party. And so being able to utilize those tools, such as rules and procedure, uh, is very important. And in the Senate, that would allow me to uh, play defense a lot more uh, with bad bills or bills that negatively affect my constituents. And so by moving to the Senate, um, I, I do believe I could be more effective. And plus, just the numbers, you know, that's 46 senators uh, versus 124 uh, representatives. So just doing the math, um, having more of an impact. And, and most importantly, District 42 is the economic hub of South Carolina, I would argue. Uh, um, and so I believe we need somebody that's intentional about bringing jobs, but also um, having when we bring these corporations here, that we have them invest in our communities, in our schools. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm going to get to that in just a second. But let me ask you right now, State Representative, what are those bad bills that are currently affecting District 42 that you want to change if you become senator? Oh, yes. So... I mean, we saw it uh, this past legislative session, uh, things such as the, the abortion ban uh, that affect a lot of my constituents negatively. Um, the, the overwhelming majority of women here um, in District 42 and, and really throughout the state uh, are against that bill, that total, that abortion ban. Um, addition to that, uh, the school bill, CRT where we limit teachers and what they can teach. Um, we limit the teaching of black history, uh, topics that are essential for our kids to learn, um, and just our just the attack on teachers and our school districts in general. Uh, and those are just two uh, outside of, of many other bills that have a negative impact, I believe, on the district. Yes, sir. So let me ask you, in, in the states in the District 42, where exactly is CRT being to teach there? Yes, so Charleston County School District, uh, Dorchester County School District. We have Dorchester County and Charleston County within District 42. And so by passing uh, legislation such as that, um, and, and even to go further in, in the budget, there was a proviso, I don't recall the exact number, um, but essentially what they did was slip in a proviso uh, that restricts um, certain curriculum that the schools can teach. Um, and it's linked to their finances, to their budget. And so it's often the threat that if they teach certain material, they can lose their funding. And so that's directly tied to Charleston County School District um, and, and what they can and cannot teach. So what exactly can they can, can and cannot teach right now in Charleston and Dorchester counties? Well, good question. So that bill basically, uh, and I was on the education committee this past year and I fought against it um, and I raised a lot of uh, concerns on it. Um, just simple things as, as defining certain terms. And, and what it does is it, it was vague in itself by saying that, uh, you know, you can't have instruction that essentially will make someone feel uh, attacked or feel that they're responsible. The idea behind that is 
Um, and I'll go to black history. Just it was the issue where we had uh, people from the other side testifying that um, or debating that by teaching uh, real black history and what happened um, in the struggle uh, that makes certain children feel as if it's their fault. Um, and so they were using that to basically say you can't teach anything that's race based uh, or anything race conscious. Uh, and so that essentially allows for individual interpretation, which is another reason why I think it's important that we have people that understand uh, the law because we pass bills that have words, um, but we don't define them. And it's left up to individual interpretation. And then as a result, there are unintended consequences. Now we'll see, you know, people suing schools, the teachers, uh, because of that, um, and also requiring them to have their curriculum up. You know, I mean, like weeks before they teach. Um, so that that basically, by requiring that, what it does is it takes away from a teacher being able to talk about current events because if something was happening now, they don't have the time to get that information out before the the class lesson. So, state representative, let me ask you this: when it comes to Charleston County. Which curriculums that they haven't been able to teach has actually allowed them to lose a lot of money? Well, this just got this just went in effect this past year. So what you'll see is the unintended consequences will come after this. Um, we haven't seen any any lawsuits specifically yet, but this was just passed this this past legislative session um, that we just finished. And so we heard from I heard from many of my constituents that are teachers. Uh, principals who were very concerned. I mean, they came up in numbers, teachers to uh, combat this in our education committee, saying why uh, this bill was not appropriate and how it would restrain them. Um, and, and ultimately, it, it places the school at a disadvantage. Um, and, and, we, and what happens is we'll lose good teachers um, that simply want to do their job that they were trained to do. Now, how many teachers have, they, have the state lost thus far because of this curriculum? Well, I, I know that I don't have an exact number, but I do know that some teachers have, have left um, because of that, because they don't want to feel restrained. You know, one, one thing I, I brought up in committee is that uh, we don't respect teachers enough. Teaching is a profession, simply. Uh, simply put, it's a profession. They're trained to teach. They're trained to understand curriculum. So we should not be telling them how to do their jobs. We don't do that with any other profession. We don't go in and tell uh, doctors how to practice medicine. Uh, but that's what essentially what we're doing is restricting teachers. When they come up and tell us what they need, we do exactly the opposite because of a political agenda from the other side. Now, I know I don't have that much along with because of Zoom, but let me ask you just quickly. How do you all define black history and how does the Republicans define black history when it comes to obviously the classrooms? Well, I think black history is you just telling the truth, simply uh, what occurred. Um, back in those times and how we got to where we are. Uh, it's, it's not a secret that, that uh, black people were slaves. They were enslaved. We weren't allowed to read or go to school. Um, and we were beaten. Black people were beaten. But what happens is the other side, uh, they don't like the blatant or the truth of it. I mean, they don't like the truth, the facts that are there. They feel that, uh, some people feel that the facts are uh, uneasy. Um, they're not comfortable and it's not meant to be comfortable. You know, uh, it, it's, it's history so that we don't repeat itself. And that's the importance of it. So we don't go back down that path. But by taking away that history, uh, you, you take away what happened and how we got here. And what that does is allow us to go back down that track. Now, let me ask you this. I was just thinking about this too. And it's probably a silly question, state representative. But why don't you all, as state representatives and state senators, just put something like this on the ballot as a referendum to see if people would be able to want to teach critical race theory? You know, um, to the point that you just made, I totally agree. In fact, we tried to do that with the abortion bill. Um, we, had a, we had an amendment that would have placed the, a referendum. Let the people decide. We, we are here to represent the people. They vote for us to... Uh, voice their opinions. And so, again, we made this point on the floor last year. Put the abortion bill on the ballot. Let the people tell us whether or not they want it banned. If the people tell us that's what they want, then we'll go with it. But the problem is the other side struck that down. They didn't want to give the people the voice 
And so I totally agree with you. I'm all for referendums because, again, that's what we're here to do. We're here to represent the people. And so not not represent political ideologies, but the people. And I agree we need more referendums. Now, because of, you know, the I guess the pick and choose curriculum, for lack of a better word, how much funding do you believe that each of these districts are going to lose because of this? Well, it depends on whether they violate the, uh, the the statute or not, and that and again, whether they violate it is left up to individual interpretation. Um, you know, one one parent may think that they taught something that was uh, you know un- inappropriate, and then they are allowed to bring uh, a suit or an action against a, a school, a disciplinary action against that teacher. Then that has to be investigated, um, and so that just that just uh, to me prolongs things. It just uh, creates chaos um, and takes away from the instructional learning, in my opinion. Um, but I mean, we have other things. You know, criminal justice reform is huge for me. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm an attorney, and so that's one of the other things that I'm very passionate about uh, in this state. Yes, sir. And I'm going to get back to that in just a sec. But you brought up obviously emotion, uh, abortion. At excuse me, people in the state I talk to ask is if a woman is forced to have a baby by the South Carolina legislator and dies in childbirth. Is the state actually going to compensate her family for the value of her life? And that's the problem. I, that's nowhere in that bill. Um, and, and so, again, it's just sad that, uh, you know, someone reached out to me, uh, a potential constituent, and, and asked, you know, they, they didn't agree with my position. I simply told them, look, I respect everyone's uh, position on this issue, but I don't believe that the government should be involved in legislating. Uh, religious ide- ideologies and that's what it is um we got to get back to separation of church and state and so i don't you know what what my belief is may be different from someone else's and, but i will never force my own opinion and my own beliefs on other people and i don't think the legislature should be doing that but should south carolina lawmakers consider punishing abusers with involuntary vaccinities instead of punishing victims with involuntary pregnancies yeah absolutely i mean why would you why would you punish a woman uh, who did not want to be pregnant, who has to now uh, carry that child to birth? Um, you know, and it's just sad because no one understands the trauma that a woman goes through uh, when doing that. And I don't believe that there's no woman or man out here that's just simply saying they want to kill a baby. And, and so I get you know tired of people saying baby killers because that's not what this is. This is sometimes there's a point where a woman. Uh, a mother may be at risk of losing her own life if she carries that child to birth. Those are important things. If a medical doctor says, you know, that it's appropriate to have an abortion because of that, then we should respect and allow that. Uh, We shouldn't be tying the hands of medical professionals who, again, they're trained. They go through a, a lot of training. They know what they're talking about. They are the experts in that area. So again, we as legislatures, we as legislators should not be uh, in the business of um, telling people what they can and cannot do in their home uh, or with their own bodies. But if they want to reverse that vaccinity, uh, state representative, let me ask you this then. Should they alert, alert, say, the local sheriff? If they do, repeat that now? Yeah, if they want to reverse that vaccinity, uh, state representative, should they at least alert, say, the local sheriff? Yeah, well, what, what's happening now, I mean, if, if you have somebody who forcibly has make somebody have a child. I mean, they should, that should be, uh, definitely report to law enforcement. The, the problem, what they're trying to do is they're putting the bill where women have to report, uh, if they're assaulted or anything, they have to report that to law enforcement within a certain amount of time in order to, um, be eligible, I believe to have an abortion. The problem is sometimes a lot of people, I mean, you know, that's hard for people to do. Um, and so you're, you're essentially making somebody do something that's uncomfortable just to be allowed to do something that could save their life. Uh, and that's a problem. Should then, and I know you mentioned this earlier about the medical professionals, but should the, the physician name the victim and provide victims health and personal information to the local sheriff? So that, and that's where, that's where it gets uh, tricky because then you come in the confidentiality, uh, you know, that, that's if a person and their doctor are having a conversation, I mean, that's HIPAA, you know. Uh, it's just like if a client and I are, are discussing something, it's attorney-client privilege. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't necessarily believe that 
a doctor should have to do that uh, just based on the confidentiality rules because you got to think about that woman then uh, i mean think about the things that can happen now she reports this person and they come after it, it's so many things that could happen which is reasons why some women don't report uh, and it's sad but but i do believe that uh Law, they should be encouraged to, and law enforcement should definitely be involved in that. When, 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 sh when a woman goes to the police, should it be just after a rape or incest? Uh, oh, I mean both. Yeah. Now, I how mean, many? Yes, sir. Now, in, in your district, how many rapes and incests actually happen each day? I don't have the exact number on that. Uh, yeah. I, now, how long should a woman's rape kit, for instance, sit on a shelf? Yeah, well, I mean, I know there's a backlog, um, and that's just a, across the nation, really. Um, and that's something that, you know, I know the legislature, legislature has done before as far as funding, um, you know, providing more funding to law enforcement uh, and the labs uh, so that they can process those things. Now, if you get in the Senate, how would you increase that, particularly for your district? Yeah, well, I mean, and that's just advocating for more funding, you know, really speaking with the, the professionals, um, speaking with SLED. I, I, I think that we should have more um, labs uh, when it comes to anything, testing, um, drug, drug analysis. Um, I think we should have more drug analysis lab instead of it just going to one hub. Um, and, and, you know, in Columbia, I think uh, the larger counties should have their own. I know Richland County has their own. A lab, and I think that does uh, a, a good thing because it does speed up uh, results in, in, in criminal cases. And so that helps. And I think I would like to see that in, in at least pilot programs in the larger counties throughout the state uh, to take some of the pressure off of SLED um, and kind of spread it, you know. Uh, but again, that's going to take funding. Um, and that's where, but, but it's, it's necessary. You know, we have to invest in things that will protect us and keep us safe. Now, how much money would you all invest in this pilot program? Well, I mean, that, that would be, we'd have to do a, probably a study committee on how much it would cost. To, uh, and I'm sure we could compare it to Richland counties. I, I think theirs is successful uh, from what I hear. They do a great job at getting things back quickly. Um, so really, we just take, I mean, it's already being done. You just take that and sort of mirror it uh, throughout the state. Now, let me ask you this, State Representative, has South Carolina already limited abortion to free pregnancy exceptions? Uh, um, you, has, has we limited to what now? Yeah, has South Carolina already limited abortion to free pregnancy exceptions? Well, they threw in, you know, so the six-week thing, um, and they did throw in some exceptions, but again, those are, those are restrained with time limits, um, and that's the problem. Uh, if you don't report in a certain time or uh, within a certain time frame, you're still prohibited. And so that's still one of the issues that people have with it. Uh, and, and I've I've even had, you know, uh, females and, and women comment on, on some of my, my posts and they say, you know, they a lot of women don't know that they're pregnant at six weeks. Um, uh, one constituent even, even commented that, you know, it was 10 weeks before she knew. And so it just it depends. Everybody's body is different, their anatomy, you know. So that that was one of the concerns. Yes, sir. And, and I want to talk to you more about this, but I want to get to some some of the basics here in your district. How do you make South Carolina State Senate District Forty Two competitive today, so that South Carolina can be better tomorrow? You said, "How do I do that?" Yes, sir. As as oh. a state senator, if elected. So again, I I mentioned earlier about District Forty Two being arguably uh the economic hub the economic engine of of south carolina um charleston for sure but definitely i believe the state i mean you have industry here the port is in district 42 uh you have uh, mercedes boeing volvo bosch um and, and so many other things and i can imagine the next 10 years um we'll have more companies and industry come here uh but with that, what we need to do is, and what I would like to do, as, as some some already do this, but be more intentional about creating partnerships, um, private public partnerships with our our colleges and our schools, our colleges and our high schools, um, so that our kids and our students are ready for the workforce. Um, and so, because these are high paying, good jobs, but the problem is we have to make sure. We're training our students and our children 
uh, to have those skills, those necessary skills to uh, be able to take on those jobs uh, so that we can keep those jobs here locally. Um, and, and that's just how it works. You know, if we invest in our in our future generation, our, our children, uh, and they can get good paying jobs, then eventually they can afford to live where they work. And then they can afford to uh, pay for housing. And it's so it's all holistically, you know, with education and good jobs. Um, and, and I think that will help also to, to lower crime as well. Now, how many high how many people in your district, District 42, actually have those high paying jobs right now? Yeah, so there is a and 42 it's a, it's if you go from one side of 42 to the other, there's a vast difference. Um, and particularly because this covers downtown Charleston, a little bit of West Ashley and North Charleston. And so uh, it's different. You have a, a lot of people who work in those high paying jobs, but then also you have a lot of um, just working class people like my parents were. Um, and, you know, what's the, the problem is we need to increase the wages uh, because as we see, housing continues to increase. The necessities, uh, food, I mean, everything is increasing except for the wages. Uh, I do believe we have a lot of people in those high paying jobs, but there could be more. And the problem with that, I believe, is just the, that gap between with training people, uh, partnering with uh, programs like Try to Tech does a, does a great job at it. Um, but we need more. We need more of these corporations to do uh, pilot programs, not even pilot programs, just programs in general with the schools, uh, you know, kind of like just get you ready to work as soon as you graduate, um, because I think that's important. Not everybody is, is um, my mom always believes that, you know, not everybody's supposed to go to college. Not everybody has to get a four year degree. You don't have to. There are there are all op different opportunities out here. We just need to provide access to those opportunities. So what is the median home price for your, uh, houses in your particular district, District 42? Oh, well, the median, I'll tell you this. Uh, I mean, the, even in North Charleston right now, average rent, I mean, is about 1300 1400 uh, And I mean, that's a lot when you're, you know, making, you know, $40,000 a year, uh, which is, it's not a lot of money with the way the cost of living is here in Charleston. Um, I say, and, and that's just the average in North Charleston. So you go downtown. I mean, it's it's even more than that. Uh, you know, six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar homes. And then you get in the millions uh, downtown Charleston, and, and these are not even waterfront properties. I mean, these are just you know inland, um, and so it's, it's skyrocketing. And we have to figure out a way to to balance that, um, have more workforce housing. Okay, and I, I want to get to that in a second, but how many renters do you have versus homeowners in District 42? Oh, renters, uh, we have more renters that, well, at least in, in the North Charleston area, um, I know because that's my, you know, my district that I've represented. Right. Um, the stats show that there are more renters. Um, I will say, coupled with maybe downtown and West Ashley, I don't know the exact number, Um uh, I can find out for you, uh, but I don't know the exact number of, of renters versus um, owners. But I do think that we need to help people uh, give them the opportunity to own their own homes. Uh, and we can do that a lot of different ways um, with taxes and whatnot. Uh, and, and I know there's a lot of restrictions now uh, dealing with short term rentals and things like that. You know, there, there's a lot of things that's going to come up, I believe, in this next legislative session or at least uh yeah 24 when we go back um because it's just a lot that we didn't get to because we were focused on the you know sort of big political things uh, from the majority party now how many short-term rentals do you have here in this district oh there, there are a lot of short-term rentals uh there are a lot of short-term rentals in in district 42 uh and all parts of it, downtown, West Ashley, North Charleston. Um, and so what we've seen is uh, particularly more so on, in the different island areas, uh, but but in the city as well, uh, a push to ban or restrict short-term rentals. Um, and so we'll see how that's going to play out um, the next couple of years as well. 
Now, where do you see the short-term rentals increasing in your district? So, you see it, um, I mean, you see it in North Charleston, really. Uh, I'll tell you, in in the Wayland area, um, you see a lot of homes that uh, are being bought people flipped. So, um, you see a lot of homes that are Airbnbs and are rentals. I mean, they're short-term rentals. Um being revitalized and that's just people coming in you know purchasing property um and 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 flipping those homes so to say and so that's you see a lot of that uh, happening in north charleston but state representative how do you all slow this gentrification despite these and nobody's you know of course you know everyone's invited to come into charleston live here right, but right how do right. you stop it how do you slow down gentrification and allow those people who've been living here for years to stay there right and so that's where we have to get creative and innovative, right? And so how do we help people to actually home, own their home, you know, pay off the mortgage? Uh, and, and there's been talk about ideas such as having um, certain homeowners, you know, if, if you're at a certain uh, income level, maybe a percentage of your income at a percentage of your income, if you pay that, um, you're allowed to own your home. Uh, and, and so I think those are innovative and creative ideas uh, that can happen and are reasonable because you have to understand that, you know, somebody making $45,000 a year, clearly that's a big difference from somebody making $140,000 a year. You can't do the same things. Um, and so, but the prices of the housing are, are the same, you know. For those two people essentially so we have to make it fair um and equitable for people now where ex uh, where exactly do you see that income level moving towards in a, in a bigger in, in a big way for your district well i think if we do i think if we focus on creating those partnerships uh, with these corporations that are moving here uh i mean these are these are high paying good jobs good benefits um i, I think if we can get those programs together with our schools, uh, with our colleges, um, and have people ready and trained for those types of jobs. Uh, I think I think over time, now this won't happen overnight. Um, it won't happen within the next two to three to five, five years. Um, but this is a long-term goal um, that you can see, you know, ten, a decade from now, you'll see, you can see the sort of fruits of the labor, um, the, the rewards from, those partnerships and the corporations really investing in the people in the community. Uh, you know, they, the corporations come here and we offer them tax incentives and tax credits. And, uh, but we also need them to invest in the community as well and our people. Now, what incentives are you giving to those people to bring more incentives to the residents of the district? Yeah, so I mean, the state is no secret. Um, every time a company comes in, there's some either the state's going to match, you know, Give them a certain amount of money so that they can come here. We just saw that in, in Columbia area with uh, Scout Motors, um, and and then you know tax credits, uh, you know lower taxes, uh, and so just things like that. But I mean, if we're going to do that, then we have to also get something in return. I, I believe, um, and and not just the the job creation, but also the being intentional about ensuring that people that live here can have those jobs how many uh, jobs are being created in your district right now oh uh well with the with the the new terminal uh there are going to be a lot of jobs once that gets you know off the ground and um we have and i know for a fact uh i mean boeing are always you know creating more jobs um they have a a large workforce a very diverse workforce uh and and, uh, and i will say to boeing's credit they have at least I've seen, you know, they've been in the community. Uh, they invest in schools locally here. Um, and so I, you know, applaud them on those efforts. Um, but we have, uh, you know, I mean, even with Volvo just moving here and right off the highway, I mean, they have a training facility where uh, it's, it's sort of like a, a school within the facility and they teach. Uh, people how to work on these electric vehicles because times are just changing you know uh, and so we have to get we have to be intentional about it, and that's why i say these partnerships uh when they're in school this is this is i mean mechanics as we used to know it is it's going to be different uh, my uncle's an auto mechanic you know but now it's, it's less you know 
working with your hands and, and, and oil and things like that, it's more computerized. You know, you got to know engineering technology. And so um, that would be, I mean, imagine if those companies, you know, go to our high schools and start and start training programs uh, with that, or even our colleges, our HBCUs. And I mean, you can get jobs directly from there because you'll be ready to go on day one. Day one. But are these people in your district, state, state representative, are they actually ready for these skills and training and, and high demand jobs? I believe that the right now uh, we could use more of these programs to, to train them. Mm -hmm. I think that we have people ready for the jobs to to have the opportunity and access for the jobs. Absolutely. But do we have a lot of work to do? Yes, we need to uh, partner with our schools and get them ready. I do believe we have more work on that end, but I believe we have plenty of people that are capable. Um, if they have the tools and the access that's provided to them, they will be successful. So what free types of workforce development programs would be ideal for your district now? Oh, well, I mean, if workforce housing, uh, it's, it would be a huge advantage. If we can get our developers to partner with them to say, hey, you know, we're, we're willing to do workforce housing um, because we have to have it where uh, based on people's income that they can afford a decent home. Uh, because, again, you have to level it out. You have to be fair and equitable. And so by these partnerships, I mean, I'm talking you going and you know, this tech programs in high schools where, you know, 11 and 12th graders, they're learning these things. They're learning the basic skills of uh, the, the engineering, the, the computerized technology that would go into uh, these new jobs that's coming. We all know EV is going to be a huge thing. It's, it's going to come one way or the other. Uh, and so we have to make sure we're training our students. I mean, internships, being intentional about that. Uh, summer programs. Uh, with with students to be able to go in and see how uh, these jobs are done and also have the educational requirements to do so. Yeah, I'm sorry about the background noise here, but let me ask you this. In Senate District 42, State Representative, is it really a workforce, how, a workforce development issue or is it a skills gap? Oh, there's, well, I think a little bit of both. Uh, there is, I believe there's a skills gap because we just, I mean, there are programs now, like I say, Trident Tech does a great job at it, um, but we need more, you know, uh, we need more. We need to go to where, where the people are, go to their schools. Uh, and I think I think that, you know, creating these in, in high school programs um, would be huge. I mean, these these kids are so s smart and, and intelligent now. They're exposed at technology and really the world at such an early age compared to even when I was you know, in high school, uh, just because of social media and the internet. Um, they literally have access to a lot of things. Uh, and so I think they're more than capable of doing that. We just need to invest in them. So what is the average growth rate for jobs in District 42? Oh, uh, the average growth rate, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make up a percentage. Uh, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I will tell you that uh, what I plan to do is is, is create more jobs um, and attract more business here. Uh, now, how, how many? How, yeah, how many new? Well, how many new jobs will you need for forty two in the next five years since that area is growing? Oh, and, and it's going to continue to grow. Um, people are moving here by the day. Uh, I mean, uh, not hundreds of people by the day, and so and, and you'll see now what we're you see a lot of development going more you know out towards North Charleston. Uh, the Somerville area, Lads and Nexton. Um, while, you know, Lads and Nexton is not necessarily in 42, but I mean, even Tanger, I mean, it's, it's transforming. Uh, and, and so what we have to do is, to your point earlier about, you know, the gentrification, I think that growth is good, but we have to make sure we don't displace people. Um, and that's the issue uh, because everybody deserves um to live in a nice area, in a safe area, but we can't price them out of their own homes. And that's where I say the innovative and creative ideas come in to uh, help people allow, allow them to be able to own their own property.
And one last question, because I only have two two minutes and eight seconds, but HBCU Day, obviously you've been a vocal advocate for HBCUs, passing legislation to create HBCU Day on the third yes. Tuesday in February to bring attention to contributions HBCUs have made in South Carolina. But how much money have you earmarked to your alma mater, SC State, in the three years that you've been in office? Well, I'll tell you this, me directly, uh, myself, have not earmarked personally any money, but I will tell you that this past legislative year, I was an advocate for uh, the project that the president came up and the board to present, and they got pretty much all the money that they requested. Um, this was a big year for South Carolina State. You're going to see a lot of expansion. Um, I'm a huge advocate of SC State because I, I'm a graduate there. Uh, and what HBCU Day would do, because, you know, I want people to say, oh, it's just a day. It's, it's just a day. No, it's not. Because to those students, it's more than just a day. When I was at South Carolina State and I wanted to get in politics, I didn't have access to legislators. Those students now have internships at the state house. Um, they have they get to interact with their local elected leaders. That's huge. It's about creating access and opportunities. And that's what HBCU Day does. And for the presidents of those universities, um, it gives them an opportunity to come up and lobby to the legislature on what they need to be successful. Well, can you name one thing you have done for the HBCU since HBCU Day? Oh, like absolutely. Seconds. Uh, creating opportunities for internships. A lot of students now intern in the state house with both caucuses with elected officials. Before that, it was it was not many students from HBCUs, but this has created a conversation and a relationship. State Representative Dion Tedder, thank you for your time here again on Quintus Close Ups. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, Zoom.